Boo! Bienvenue, Magic Players. It's me, Insignios, coming to you live from the spooky 80s horror-inspired lands of Duskmorn to talk about all the cards from the set, primarily in the 60-card formats. And speaking of lands of Duskmorn, we have a brand new cycle of rare lands. The Verge lands are a new cycle of dual lands that enter untapped and can immediately tap for one color and potentially tap for a secondary color if you control a land with either of the corresponding land types of the colors of the land. Well, that's a word salad. This land can tap for red on its own if you control either a mountain or a forest, you can tap for green. These lands are very reminiscent of Nimbus Maze all the way back from Future Sight. And while they're pretty good in certain decks, you don't want to run them in other certain decks. Let me explain. So this land taps for red and can sometimes tap for green. This is perfect for mono red storm in modern, but it's not so great if you want to play a balanced red green aggressive deck. For decks like that, you'd be much better off with the pain lands or shock lands. But all things considered, I really hope they flesh out this cycle because if you want a complete cycle of this kind of land, you need to make 20 cards. Say, a white land that can tap for green, as well as a green land that can tap for white. By far, the Verge land that sees the most play is Gloom Lake Verge because of Demir Murktide. Or is it Oculus Murktide? Demir Oculus? We'll, we'll get to that later. But maybe you could also play it in Modern Merfolk to help you pay for some of those dismembers so that way you're not losing as much life? <laughs> yeah, Modern Merfolk. Okay, okay, yeah, sure. It, that deck is nowhere near relevant anymore. Now you might be wondering why I'm on Duskborn in the first place. Well, that's because I was invited to try out one of their brand new haunted houses, free of charge. Being a content creator certainly has its perks. Dive into the scariest place in the seven seas. It's a house, but what, is it pirate themed? You know, whatever, it doesn't matter because there's nothing in there that could scare me. <laughs> Okay, um, sorry. Sorry. I I'm an Arclight Phoenix player and anything that shuts down the graveyard kind of scares me half to death. But you know what, despite that, I'm happy to see Leyline of the Void get reprinted. Sure, we've never gotten a different Black Leyline, but Void is a card that needs to be reprinted and reprinted often. And that's because it's very necessary for older formats in order to combat the yearly new graveyard deck. Don't believe me? 2024 we had Frog, 23 we had Scam, 22 we had Yawgmoth, 21 we had Murktide, 2020 we had Luris, 2019 we had Hogak, 2018 had Phoenix, and that's just modern. And cards that are necessary for older format sideboards tend to keep climbing if they don't receive a reprint often. And the best example is that for a brief moment in 2018, Leyline of the Void cost $70 a card. Sure, it was primarily because it had only ever been printed twice, but... $70 for Leyland of the Void. A lot of people were disappointed by Leyland of the Void's reprint, but honestly, it's good for the health of the game. So let's close the door on that discussion and move on. <coughs> That's not... Uh-oh. Uh, if you want to hear more about the new Ley Lines, well, you're in luck because we have exactly one great new Ley Line for 60 Card Constructed, and that's Ley Line of Resonance. The typical leyline text of if it's in your opening hand goes into the battlefield at the beginning of your first turn. Whenever you cast an instant or sorcery that targets a creature you control, copy it. You may choose new targets for the copy. And at this point, we've all heard about the combo. Turn zero, leyline in opening hand. Turn one, play a scamp or a mouse. Turn two, play two pump spells, either monstrous rage or turn inside out, another new card from Duskmorn. Turn three, you win the game. The best part is that the overall deck you'd build around the combo is actually solid already. So the ley line becomes a very good card, regardless of you getting all of these cards into your opening hand. Which is very fortunate, since while a cool way to win the game on turn two, this combo is very susceptible to interaction, as well as the very concept of luck. Much like any deck, you'll want some sort of contingency plan in the event of an untimely malfunction. Speaking of, Untimely Malfunction. One in red, instant, destroy an artifact, change the target of target spell to another target, and two creatures can't block this turn. Destroying an artifact is always useful, being able to redirect a spell or ability is very underrated, and making two creatures unable to block might win a game someday. This card is very versatile, and that's the best kind of sideboard card. And considering a braid still sees play in formats like Legacy, this card is a slam dunk. And speaking of Legacy, Ancient Cellar Spawn, 3 mana 3-3, three, three, Enchantment Horror, has a cost reduction on other, what was it, horrors, nightmares, and demons, oh my. But the main thing we care about is its second ability. Whenever you cast a spell for less than its mana cost, your opponent loses life equal to the difference. While this card was obviously made to complement Miracle specifically, Legacy can really abuse this ability. 
This means force of will causes your opponent to lose 5 life. This also applies to Daze, Snuff Out, Murktide Regent, Fury, Leyline Binding. Despite being an enchantment creature, it also technically works really well in Affinity. Now there's one more Commander Precon card that I think will be really good in Legacy, and that's Metamorphosis Fanatic. 6 mana 4-4 four, four with lifelink, and when it enters, return a creature card from your graveyard to the battlefield with a lifelink counter on it. Not a finality counter on it, a lifelink counter. All that's fine I guess, but why would it see playing Legacy? Well, that's because it has Miracle for 1 in a black. Legacy Reanimator, like almost every Legacy deck, plays Brainstorm. So you can very easily include one or two of these guys in your deck to pull off some sweet plays. I love the design of this card. It's unique, but it's not backbreaking, like most cards they design these days. Speaking of powerful cards, Demonic Council. One in a black, sorcery, search your library for a demon card, put it into your hand, then shuffle. But if you have Delirium, it's any card. This is just Demonic Tutor. Sure, it has some extra steps, but it is just Demonic Tutor. A card that's banned in Legacy and restricted in Vintage. And the Delirium requirement is barely a hindrance since it's super easy to get Delirium. Here's a fun fact for you. Tutors are restricted in Vintage because the whole point of the format is that you're only supposed to have one copy of busted cards. Low cost tutors are essentially extra copies of those cards, but with one extra step of some black mana. The restriction on calling the Great Creator as well as Monastery Mentor doesn't really mean much when you have four cards in your deck that can tutor them up. And considering it's super easy to get Delirium and Vintage, I wouldn't be surprised if this card got restricted there at some point. Unfortunately, one thing you can't tutor up is some copies of Say Its Name and Altenac. Seriously, I didn't see any at the pre-release, and I went 4-0 and got 10 prize packs. Not a single copy of either. But now that I'm on Duskmorn, I think I know a way to bring him out. Altenac, Altenac, Altenac. Huh, really thought that would work. Boo! Oh, Say its name is great for any deck that wants to utilize the graveyard, like Pioneer, Abs and Grease Fang, or any Jun Delirium deck. And that's because Say its name can't be responded to with targeted graveyard hate, because it itself doesn't target. You get to choose the card after the mill as one action. And by running a playset, you can just run one copy of Altanac as a backup win condition. But the deck I'm most excited to put Altanac into is Modern Living It. During your first two turns, you crack some fetches, then you use Altanac's ability on turn two to get a land back and essentially have four mana on turn three. This allows you to play one of your Cascade spells while also holding up mana for a Mystical Dispute, or you can just play Press the Enemy during your opponent's turn. Just be careful against any deck that plays Orcish Bowmasters, because as soon as they target Altanac, you lose the game. This is because whenever Altanac is targeted by an opponent's ability, you must draw a card before that ability resolves, which triggers the Bowmaster again. Bowmaster triggers Altanac, you draw a card before the damage is dealt, which puts another Bowmaster trigger on the stack, you must draw the card. Essentially, you deck yourself. So while Altanac isn't the best card for modern right now, it's yet another reason to want a Bowmaster's ban. Why are you even here, Dre? I'm saving you from the deep end, bird boy. Do you know how heavily locked up this place is? I had to swim through the water pipes just to get here. You know what? I don't want to deal with you right now. So how about you pick a door to go through and I'll go through the other. A split in the river? It's just two doors, that's stupid. Wait, why are you going along with the house? Well, someone clearly put a lot of effort into making this house and it's the least we can do. Also, it's what's on the card. Sure, it's a decent board wipe, but I don't think words printed on a piece of cardboard are meant to be taken literally. Can't hear you, I'm leaving. Delirious bird brain. Speaking of, Delirium makes its triumphant return in Duskmorn, and it's more or less just as powerful as its last appearance. And I'm not talking about Eldritch Moon. Peer Past the Veil is 4 mana to discard your hand and draw a bunch of cards in red-green. That's not something you see every day. I think this is going to be a great card for Pioneer specifically because 4 mana is the same CMC as the One Ring, and Infect plays the One Ring now. So... yeah. With Delirium, Omnivorous Flytrap is essentially a 3 mana 4 6. But you get more counters as you attack and you can spread them out. Best of all, if you can get 6 different types in your graveyard, it can double counters on creatures. The Flytrap reminds me a lot of Tarmogoyf in how it's a low drop efficient creature that relies on the graveyard. But unlike Tarmogoyf, the bulk up can be spread across your team. And there's no upper limit to how big it can get. But by far the best cards with Delirium from Duskmorn are the creatures that are also artifacts or enchantments. A creature with two types and a Delirium ability is so synergistic. Just look at Wildfire Wickerfolk. Sure, a 2 mana 3 2 with haste is good, but a 2 mana 4 3 with haste and trample is really good. Patrick BC is single green for a 3 3 artifact creature that can't attack or block unless you have Delirium. 
but you mill a card at the beginning of each of your upkeeps. The Beastie reminds me a lot of Darcy and how it's a one drop 3-3 three, three that needs Delirium to turn on and has ability that fills your graveyard. Normally, not being able to attack or block would ruin this guy's chances at seeing play, but being an artifact and a creature makes it really synergistic with Delirium strategies, so it gets a pass. Fear of Missing Out is an enchantment creature for one in red that's a 2-3 with a forced rummage on ETB, meaning that if you don't have any cards in hand and can't discard, you still get to draw the card. But its Delirium ability is the best part about it. Whenever it attacks for the first time each turn while you have Delirium, untap a creature you control, then you get an additional combat this turn. These abilities combined make it perfect for Pioneer's Mardu Grease Fang, Modern Hollow One, as well as the somewhat forgotten Is It Murktide. Untap Grease Fang to get out another vehicle from your graveyard and have Grease Fang crew it. Help discard cards in Hollow One so that way you can get them out into the battlefield and swing for additional damage. Adds to the Delirium Visit Murktide, as well as that you swing with it twice. Being an enchantment creature adds two to the Delirium counter, so most red aggro decks will be able to find space for FOMO. And the more secret lair variants you pair with it, the better. With how much you can do with the fear of missing out, I wouldn't be surprised if you thought it was the best card from Duskmorn, but there's actually one more red card that I think is actually better, and that is Clockwork Percussionist. Yes, really, look, just hear me out. One drop, one one, monkey toy, artifact creature with haste, and when it dies, you exile a card from the top of your library, and you may play that card until the end of your next turn. Remember Goblin Guide and how it puts a clock on your opponents? Well, this is that, but as a monkey, and you get the card advantage, not your opponent. Sure, it's not a 2-2, but a 1-1 one, one with haste is still putting pressure onto your opponent. That's a lot for an uncommon. Wait, it's a common? Oh my god, Popper beware, you're in for a scare. Ah, there are just so many great cards from the set. I wonder if Insignius is having just as much fun as I am. <laughs> okay, I'll hide here. Nothing in here is, there's nothing scary in here. Absolutely nothing to be scared of. Just a bunch of dolls and other toys. Arabella might seem small, but she isn't a card you should overlook. Being able to damage your opponents and gain life is great for low to ground aggro decks. And it's super easy to abuse. All you need to do is spit out a bunch of little guys, and with how popular Convoke folk strategies have gotten, she's basically a mini flage in both Standard as well as Pioneer. And in Modern, she really is just a mini flage. Ocelot Pride, Ajani, and Bowmasters all power up her ability. I wonder if a deck with all of those cards would be good. Oh wait, that's right, it's all over Modern. Oh wow, that's really cool. Wait, who, who's, who said all that? Over here. Hello. Would you like to play with me and my friend Marvin over the Tree of Perdition? He recently won a major Pioneer tournament. Hey, you, you guys don't want to go in there. There's a really creepy doll. Sure, anytime. You're not so bad yourself, actually. A 2-mana two 2-2 two -two with haste and trample is really good, but when it can come back as a 3-3 three -three whenever another non-zombie creature dies, that's insane value. Any Rakdos aggro deck that doesn't play any other zombies can just play this. You don't even need any other graveyard synergies. Plus, it doesn't have to be your creature. But if I had to put this in some sort of graveyard deck, I'd say Rakdos Sacrifice and Pioneer. Sack the cat, cast this, hit for face, Profit. And you, Unstoppable Slasher, you've created an entire new archetype in both Standard and Pioneer. Focus around yourself as well as the, uh, the bat thing from Lost Caverns of Ixalan. I don't remember its name. I really should have written that down. Right. Still zombies. What, you think I went upstream without a paddle? Of course it came prepared. It's a little weird that they have a card referencing Luigi's Mansion in this set of all things, but the GameCube is over 20 years old at this point and nothing scarier than the passage of time. Ghost Vacuum is a one drop artifact that taps, you exile target card from a graveyard, and you can pay six, tap, and sacrifice it at sorcery speed to bring all creatures exiled with the Ghost Vacuum onto your battlefield except their 1 1 spirits with flying. It's a fusion of Relic's one drop single tap exile and Hearse's targeted removal with a potential threat. But running it really depends on your deck. Unlicensed Hearse hits two cards at a time and can represent a huge creature. And Relic has the emergency exile everything. But Ghost Vacuum is perfect for something like Reanimator, because if your opponent ever tries to use Surgical Extraction to get rid of your things, you can, in response, exile it and then later on bring it back. 
it's great for something like Archon of Cruelty or Traxa, which have great ETB and attack triggers. So it's honestly like, who cares if they're 1-1s? One They'll still win you the game, especially if you get multiple out at the same time. But a vacuum isn't the only thing you should bring to a haunted house if you want to be prepared. You also want some blunt sports equipment, some holy literature, some unholy literature that uses kindling, as well as a bottle and a bottle. And with all of that, you're prepared for anything. <laughs> You see, like that, like, that's what this bottle's for. Razorkin Needlehead is red red for a human assassin that deals one damage to each opponent whenever they draw a card. And the best part, it does not exclude the one card they draw each turn, so no matter what, this card is good against your opponent. This card's gonna be great against Pioneer Phoenix and potentially the One Ring in Modern, but Bowmasters already has that covered. Unfortunately, well, I guess actually fortunately, this card is nowhere near as good as Bowmaster's. It's not just because Bowmaster makes an army, or that it can hit any target, or that it activates on ETB. Wow, oh, Bowmaster does a lot. But it's mostly because of the flash speed. When your opponent thinks they're safe to draw a bunch of cards, you send out Bowmaster's to deal damage to them. Without flash, Razor can Needlehead can be played around. It's a shame that this card can't match up to the power creep, but in all honesty, that's a good thing most of the time. And considering how many players play Arclay Phoenix and Pioneer, this card was kind of necessary. Don't you wish there were just good remakes nowadays? You see, like that. That's a good remake. Stigma Lasher was originally from, uh, what's the set's name? Uh, it's probably not important. I don't think many people like that set, so we can just, it doesn't matter. But it had the ability to shut down your opponent's life game for the rest of the game and gave them no way to get around it. Screaming Nemesis brings back that ability, but makes it so much better. A 3-mana 3-3 with haste is already a great attacker, but if they try to block it, they're barred from gaining life for the rest of the game, or you can just have it hang back as a blocker, so if they attack into it, that also bars them from gaining life for the rest of the game. In modern, you can target it with your own bow masters to make sure your opponents can't gain life going forward, or you can just hit it with a galvanic discharge and net two energy off of it. This is exactly the kind of card we needed to go up against Shieldred, or Flage, or Malia. Oh wait. Oh wait! It's such a well-designed card, I guess I have to take it back. Sometimes a remake can be better than the original, especially when you can't officially remove the nemesis via damage. You know what? This card is actually a great flavor win. So many unwanted remakes of beloved franchises from the 80s, the original creature's controller still has a creature, but it's just not the one they wanted. It's also a reference to Swords to Plowshares and Path to Exile, as it's an instant for a single white that completely removes a creature, while also giving something to your opponent. And the last way it's flavorful is that it's unwanted. Why was this card made? Seriously, I get you want a piece of removal that has the set mechanics stapled onto it, but just reprint Path to Exile into Pioneer already. Like, seriously. Just re-release the sequel. It was the best one. We don't need more remakes. Speaking of Manifest Red, we had a bunch of Face Down Matters cards from Murders at Karlov Manor, and I've been trying to build a standard deck around that for a while, and Hauntwood Shrieker finally puts that deck like on the map. Seriously, combine the Shrieker with, uh, what's that card with, um, uh, that one Centaur. Ah, uh, I forget its name. I really should write these down. But yeah, no, like, I'll let you know if, like, some sort of standard deck, br standard deck brew comes of that, because I really like the idea. But if we want to talk about the best card with Manifest Dread, look no further than Abhorrent Oculus. A 3-mana 5-5 five five with flying, it manifests Dread at the beginning of each opponent's upkeep. Sure, you have to exile six cards in addition to its casting cost to get it onto the battlefield, but as a three drop, you can bring it back with Unearth. Originally, I was going to talk about how this card could replace Murktide region in Demir Frogtide in Modern, but everyone else has already done that, so I really don't need to talk about it much. But I'm still gonna. Psychic Frog allows you to discard this card into the graveyard so you can get it out with Unearth. The Manifest Dread fills up your graveyard so you can activate Psychic Frog's flying ability. And you can still play Murktide region in the deck because despite exiling six cards, it continues to fill your graveyard. Oh yeah, and the most notable thing about Abhorrent Oculus is that it manifests Dread during each of your opponent's upkeeps, your opponent's upkeeps. Even when returning it with Helping Hand and Standard, you'll still get a 2-2 blocker. If you thought all the orcs and cats in Modern were bad, just wait until you have an army of 2 2 staring you down. Sure, most of them will probably be instants and sorceries given the decks the eyeball sees play in, but you never know which one will turn out to be yet another Abhorrent Oculus that got into the battlefield without having to exile any cards from the graveyard. I believe this card is good enough to continue to see modern play, but I still don't know if it's better than Murktide Regent. Oculus is susceptible to removal that Murktide Regent is actually immune to, like Unholy Heat and Fatal Push. But in all honesty, getting it out with Unearth is just really cool. But aside from Psychic Frog, how do we get it into the graveyard? 
Why with Kaito? Bane of Nightmares, of course. Four mana for a four loyalty planeswalker with ninjutsu, one blue black. How do you ninjutsu a planeswalker? Well, Kaito is a creature on your turn as long as it has loyalty counters on it. A 3-4 ninja with hexproof to be specific. Plus one, you get an emblem with ninjas you control get plus one plus one. That's right, an emblem. The thing that's forever that you can't get rid of. Zero, surveil two. Draw a card for each opponent that lost life this turn. The surveil is perfect for stuff like Murktide or Oculus or Psychic Frog. And with minus two, tap target creature, put a two stun counters on it. Not the greatest thing in the world, but its utility is very useful. Plus, since it has ninjutsu, if you have multiple in your hand, you can just keep swapping them out. And since the emblems are forever, it will just keep getting bigger. Hell, in Modern and Legacy, you can keep using Kaito to ninjutsu out your bowmasters for like either save them or get repeated triggers. And speaking of Legacy, Kaito is already seeing play there alongside Yuriko in this sweet ninja's brew. So yeah, a fantastic card all around. But they aren't the only main character from Duskmourne's story that I think is good enough to see play. Nico finally makes the return to the magic story, and for once, they have a starring role. When they enter, you get two shard tokens, which have pay two, sacrifice, scry one, draw a card. Pay two and tap, exile a non-legendary creature you control, and all of your shards become a copy of that creature until end of turn, and the exiled creature comes back. I think Nico is one of the key cards we can use to finally bring Mill to Pioneer. Sure, Pioneer has had a couple mill decks, one was self-mill combo, and the other was rogues, was just rogue creature type that kind of milled, but the main strategy was just an aggro deck that sort of milled. But the main stars of the deck are Scrabbling Skullcrab and Sage of Mysteries. Whenever an enchantment enters the battlefield under your control, target player mills a X amount. What you do is you combine this with all the enchantments that force your opponents to mill whenever you draw cards. See, when Nico enters, the two shards that enter will trigger all of your little guys that mill off of enchantments. And you can sacrifice them to draw cards, which will trigger those enchantments that mill your opponents when you draw cards. And for each Nico you play, you get more shard tokens. And if you just hoard your shard tokens, you can sacrifice them to draw cards to keep milling your opponent. You can also add some Fable Passages and Fields of Ruin and bring Ruin Crab if you want. Is this a dumb idea? Yes. But is it fun and creative? Also yes. This place sucks. This place rules! The Wandering Rescuer is a fantastic card for swing wide strategies like Convoke or Creature Combo decks. Five mana, Convoke, Double Strike on a 3-4 that gives all of your tapped creatures hexproof. This is great for standard Convoke, but I don't know about the main board for Pioneer Convoke because they already have Venerated Loxodon which is much better as a win condition, so this could easily just see play as two in the sideboard. But Modern is where I think Wandering Rescuer will make its home. With how many tokens you can spit out in that format, especially with Ocelot Pride, you can easily get this onto the battlefield and protect all of your cats. So long as you aren't playing the Raptor, you can easily slot this into any Boros or Mardu energy deck. Or you can play this in an Orzhov creature combo deck, like the ones focused around War and Soul Trader. But if we're talking about cards specifically for creature combo decks, look no further than Popular Egotist. Whenever you sacrifice a permanent, target opponent loses one life, you gain one life. In Pioneer Rakdos Sacrifice, it's essentially four more copies of Mayhem Devil. Sure, it doesn't trigger off your opponent's sacrifice stuff, but when it comes to Pioneer, they're not exactly playing fetch lands, so it's not the biggest downside. If anything, it allows you to play non-red sacrifice decks, maybe even Golgari or Orzhov. But if you want to talk about modern creature combo decks, Enduring Vitality is a great one of in Yawgmoth. Not only does it give all of your creatures the ability to tap for mana, it can be sacrificed in a pinch and come back to maintain that ability. The rest of the cycle isn't bad, well, except for the red one, the red one's not great, but the other three are pretty good. It's just that uh, there's not really the, a lot of decks that want these kinds of abilities, you know? But if you do happen to go up against any of them, might I recommend Exercise. It's great removal for modern Flage decks as it hits the ring, enemy Flages, and whatever else they might throw at you. In all honesty, I'm genuinely shocked we never had a card named Exercise before this set. Keeping up with the conversation about decks that kind of fell off that got new tools from this set, we got a bunch of new auras. Unable to Scream is a great card for modern's mono blue Belcher. Yes, it is real, and yes, it will hurt you. Sporogenic Infection is just a two for one, especially if you have Bowmasters. If only we still had Luris. Oh wait, there's Timeless. But the best auras are the ones for Pioneer Lightpaws decks. 
Shard Mage's Rescue gives the creature you control hexproof and can tutor up Kaya's ghost form in a pinch. Optimistic Scavenger is great in those aura decks as it can pump up all of your creatures that aren't receiving all those auras. Last and certainly not least is Sheltered by Ghosts. Insane removal for light pause decks. Seriously, play any two drop aura and you tutor this from your deck. Bombless Pool and Roaring Furnace are useful interaction cards for the early game that become powerful enchantments in the late game, especially for modern rhinos. That's right, modern rhinos. It's not a bad archetype. You're all just cowards. What was that? Bombless Pool and Roaring Furnace are very useful interaction cards for the early game when you're playing the Quintorious Combo and Pioneer. This is because while they're in the deck, they have the combined mana cost, which means Quintorious or the Dinosaur doesn't see them when you discover. An early game interaction is something that decks like this tend to struggle with. But the best part is that you can use the other sides, being Locker Room and Steaming Sauna, as late game enchantments to help you uh, outvalue your opponents. Oh, hey, what's up? But, Drewy? What the? Where'd you come from? Yeah, I was just in the other room. Huh. Who would have guessed the pool locker rooms were right next to the sauna? I imagine anyone who's ever been to a YMCA. Oh, who's a good girl? We've all heard about Best Girl Kona, how you can tap them to get out on missions. And while it's not the most consistent archetype in the world, it's still hilarious. Especially with omniscience coming back in Foundations, you can do it in Standard. Wait, do you know the way out? <coughs> Thank goodness, just take us there. Take us to whatever or whoever can get us out of here. <coughs> Who are you? Oh, hey, it's Marina. You know her. Did you not read the lore? Ugh. B TLDR, she's the reason Duskmorn is Duskmorn. Oh. Ooh, you would be really good in the Enigmatic Incarnations deck in Pioneer. See, Marina is basically niv Reborn, but for enchantments. And for a deck that is primarily enchantments, you're essentially drawing seven. And the deck I think she will specifically see play in is Pioneer Enigmatic Incarnations, a deck that uses the titular card to sacrifice enchantments to bring out larger creatures. <coughs> Attracts it! Unfortunately, the deck fell out of relevance because the way you use Enigmatic Incarnation is I have to sacrifice an enchantment to get out a creature, and not the other way around. Sure, you could use enchantment creatures, but there weren't enough good ones to really justify the deck's existence. That is, until now. The Overlords are a cycle of high-cost enchantment creatures with impending. You cast them at a lower cost, they enter the battlefield with impending counters on them that you remove at the beginning of each of your end steps. For as long as the impending counters are on them, they're just enchantments and not creatures. Once the last one is removed, they become creatures again. Each one comes with an ability that triggers on ETB as well as attack. If I had to choose, I'd say the best three are the green, the red, and the black. The green one gives you a land with all basic land types, which allows you to play Leyline Binding, a card that you can then sacrifice to your Enigmatic Incarnation to get out of Traxa. The red one deals 4 damage to any target. Fortunately, it's not divided like Furies. But if your opponent ever takes out your Traxa, you can use it as an alternate win condition. And lastly, the Black Overlord is just great in any graveyard strategy deck, such as Pioneer Greasefang and Modern Living It. And all these overlords trigger up the Beanstalk, which means you can run those in the Enigmatic Incarnations deck. And because you have up the Beanstalk, you're going to need a big library, which means you can play Yorion. It's like looking at the little deck that could. Coming back to prominence. Sure, it's win condition as a Traxa, but what else are you going to use? Thalgavoth? Hey! You dare question my competitive viability! Well, um, uh... Spit it out, boy! Do you want to tell him, or, or should I? Oh, what, me? Oh, oh, no, no, please, I insist, you do it. Stupid question, right? So, um, while your ward is basically hexproof, it doesn't do a lot to feed into your ability. And that's because ward is a trigger ability that goes on the stack, and unless the permanents they sacrifice have flash, you're not going to be able to cast them in time. Plus, if they sacrifice the permanents, that means you're basically gone already. And with you gone, those exiled cards are also gone forever. You can't get out another version of Valgavoth and still have access to those cards. But if those cards were exiled with a Duskborn counter and your ability to let you cast anything with a Duskborn counter, you'd be a much better card and would also be kind of like an allusion to how the nightmare never ends and franchises live forever with endless sequels. A card like that would actually be pretty good. Side note, Nowhere to Run is also in the set and even though it won't be a sideboard all-star, it's still a great card if any hexproof or ward abilities just get too out of hand. Also, have you, like, read Atraxa? Let's see, well, that's a little curious. Wait, for each card type! Yeah, it's a shame. They kind of, like, perfected the reanimation target. 
Wow, I don't know what to say. Fr frankly, I'm just stunned. Wait. Stunned? We'll walk through the water right place in the river. Dive into the scariest place in the life. seven seas. Wait, Valgloth, watch out! <laughs> oh no, they got your love interest! There's only one thing in the multiverse sick and twist enough to do this. Show yourself, modern merfolk. So it seems you've figured out my plan to destroy you once and for all. Man, it's like every Halloween you have to deal with this guy. I've filleted your ass before and I'll fillet it again. Are you sure you'll be able to get past my brand new merfolk, Flood Pitch Drowner? How is that a merfolk? Right? That just looks like a normal fish. In what universe is that just a normal fish? Oh, I assure you, there are merfolk through and through. Two mana with flash that capture opponents' creatures. Not only that, it caps them with a stun counter on them. And the vigilance it has synergizes well with its tap ability of sending itself and any creature with a stun counter on it back into their owner's libraries. By being able to target any creature with a stun counter on it and sending itself into the library as well, I am able to loop this ability with my entire playset. No, oh, please, all I need is an engineered explosive to beat you. Are you sure you'll be able to do that when I turn all of your steam vents into nothing but islands? Right, yeah, no, you, you, you would be playing that now, wouldn't you, huh? Thanks to the Modern Horizons trilogy, I have so many ways to counteract your spells, given that I have the mana and resources for them. But that shouldn't be a problem, as I have an abundance of mana thanks to my Aether Vials. But I guess any amount of mana would look like an abundance to you when I start tapping all of your lands. Okay, that's like the most annoying thing you could do with magic. Oh, I agree, it is quite despicable. But for each land of yours I tap, I get a merfolk token. The phoenix's attack! <laughs> Powerful, but a fruitless effort. Any damage you deal to me, I will deal back to you twice fold on the crackback. Uh, uh, I could, have, I could have some kind of card around here that can do that. Goodbye, Insidious. And when you get to hell, tell Grief and Fury I said hello. Well, he's dead. With him out of the way, I shall rule this plane with an iron fin. What? No! What is going on? In my younger days, I would catalog every single deck I went up against, in hopes of creating the perfect sideboard. But nowadays, I just light everything on fire. What have you done to my army? Pyroclasm. One in a red, sorcery, deal two damage to each creature. One of the best sweepers in the game is now in Pioneer. You may have taken out my foot soldiers, but my generals are still able to fight. While Anger of the Gods is more final and Brotherhood's End is more versatile, nothing beats the two for two value, especially when you can cast two in a single turn. You may have taken out most of my creatures, but the symmetrical damage took out yours as well. It seems you forgot to consider that I'm a conniving bastard. All I need is a little sleight of hand, to bury you alive. See, this is my best of one is trash. If I have my sideboard, I totally- Go, my birds! Attack! <laughs> we did it! We saved Duskborn, and now we can go home! Yeah, and once we get home, we can start prepping the video for Foundations! Are you serious? Oh my goodness, oh, there's just so many cards. I love Magic the Gathering. It's the gift that doesn't stop giving. And that's the scariest thing about it.